Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the uh, uh, the first uh, uh, chemical engineering colloquium series, the rejuvenated chemical engineering colloquium series. So we had it long back, uh, much before the COVID era, and we have brought back a Friday afternoon seminars. And uh, we are happy to have uh, Professor Shankaran Sundaresan as the uh, first speaker in the series. Uh, he's the uh, uh, distinguished professor in IIT, IITM. Uh, Long pending visit, so was, uh, we are fortunate to have him here for this couple of weeks. Uh, professor Sundaresan is currently uh, Norman John Solenberger Professor in Engineering in the Department of uh, Chemical and Biological Engineering. Uh, he is an alumnus of IIT Madras Chemical Engineering from 1977-76. He worked with Professor Anand on his uh, BTEC project, so his guide is here. So, and, uh, I'm scared. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, he is MS in the University of Houston in 1978 and PhD from University of Houston in 1980. Uh, his uh, primary research areas have been the, uh, broadly in energy environment, surface science and catalysis, uh, both theory and computation. He's got a lot, big list of awards. I don't, uh, I can't read them now, uh, but you can go and see his website and uh, it's there. And uh, without... Uh, uh, much delay. I think I'll hand it over to him. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. This is my home and this is where I got trained and coming here is a uh, place sometime when I talk to the faculty, I feel like uh, a person with the 40 years of experience teaching and doing research and when I talk to the students, I feel like a student again and it's a, it's a, it's a good feeling and uh, um, I had uh, wonderful instructor teachers like uh, MS Anand. He taught us two courses, and I was also doing a senior thesis project with him. And uh, um, it, it's a solid foundation that helped me to go and uh, um, have a, a long productive career um, afterwards. Um, I have worked on problems dealing with gas particle flows and gas liquid flows and gas liquid solid flows. And today I will focus on problem dealing, some problems dealing with gas solid flows that I worked on. So I picked out three stories that I'll walk through about gas particle flows. The first one is something that we have worked on for about 20 plus years uh, on how particle transport issues in fluidized beds and circulating fluidized beds. I'll give you a walk through some um, highlight the stories on that. Then I'll talk through problems involving particle transport and deagglomeration in dry powder inhalers that you use in biomedical devices that many of you might have. And uh, if time permits, uh, I don't know how long we'll have, I will try to say a few things about some more recent work on how particles pick up electrical charges uh, when they move and how that um, affects the flow. And if the, uh, the tribal charging is a safety hazard to begin with, and when it is not a safety hazard, it can still affect the flow. So some of the stuff that we have done on tribal charging of particles. So for those of you who are not familiar with fluidization, it must be close to zero. Uh, let me just quickly walk through that. So if you imagine a bed of particles, and then if you put gas flowing up through the, um, through the, through the bed, and if you keep increasing the velocity of the gas, you find that they, you get a packed bed up to a certain point. And when the gas velocity increases a little bit, the bed might expand a little bit, but still look homogeneously. And after a while, you get bubbles and if you, then the bubbles become slugs. And if you go further, the slugs um, and the bubbles become irregular in what we call turbulent regime. And when you get to this sort of regime, a lot of particles get carried over. So you have to bring the particle back with the return line. And if you keep increasing the gas flow even further, you get the phase inversion where the particle rich region breaks up into clusters and uh, streamers like I show here, and then the the particle lean region becomes continuous. And you can see that there's a lot of spatial inhomogeneity in how the particles are distributed here. And the same thing applies in these problems as well. If you look at many of the industrial reactors, they tend to operate in these two regimes. So the question that people often ask is that, that how do you think about scaling up these when you have various types of uh, structures that can span the size of the vessel? And if you go even higher, you get what's called pneumatic transport. That's often used in transporting material, but not necessarily as chemical reactors. These are the ones that use as chemical reactors. So if you look at what people did in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and even early 90s, they were trying to understand that what causes, how do bubbles look like, what, what drives the bubble, and then what these clusters and streamers look like, and then what drives those quantities. Can we get some experimental photographs? And the 
problem that we were looking at in the 90s is to figure out what's the minimum physics that we have to put in to be able to reproduce these sort of structures in the flow problem. So you get an idea of what drives them. And if you think about what drives them, you can imagine that, that the properties of the gas that you are using will make a difference. And the particle size, the particle diameter, particle density, and the particle size distribution, they should also matter. And if you look at how they come into play in the fluidization behavior, there's a classic study by Geldart where you, you divided all the particles into four groups. And um, these, the large particles, here is the size of the particle, and here is the density of the particle minus the density of the gas, which is basically density of the particles. Very large particles and very heavy particles cannot be fluidized. So D stands for difficult to fluidize. And B means that these are particles that immediately bubble when the pressure drop exceeds the weight of the balance of the weight of the bed. This A particle are something that manifests this small window of uniform expansion and C are too cohesive. You, they won't fluidize at all. And if you look at where most of the industrial processes are, they tend to be in this window. And so the question comes is that how do you think about um, modeling and understanding what goes on in that, that range? And as I'll point out later, that this, this separation is one where the interparticle forces begin to become important. So if you look where particle uh, the group B is, the interparticle forces are not important and you primarily have particles just colliding with each other through hard sphere collisions. But once you go to A, you start getting interparticle forces like Van der Waals forces, electrostatic forces, forces with wet liquid films and so on coming into play. So a lot of the early work that has happened through under, to, to understand have been primarily focused on group B because we want to understand, because they also show all this behavior. Therefore, interparticle forces are not critical to be able to capture those behavior. So this is the kind of problem that people have been looking at. And if I give you an example of um, how it looks here, for example, is a high velocity flow where you have a riser and then the, the gas and the gas comes in, picks up the particle, they get transported up, particles get separated and circulate back. So you get particle, particles going round and round and the gas, you do a reaction and then you separate and send them out. So if you look at high speed images that have been taken by uh, people at NETL in Morgantown, and you can see that the, the particles are on an average going up, but near the walls, they are all falling down. And if you look at close up of that, you can see the particles are falling down. And if you look a further close up, you start seeing this domain. And if you see further, you see the particles colliding and then moving around. So you can see that, that we have structures that form in this system. So what, these are the clusters and streamers. These are generally large particles taken for the purpose of imaging. The real particles are smaller than these. So if you time average what you see in terms of this, in these uh, riser flows, you find that the particles and the gas are going up in the, in the domain, the center core, and near the wall, they are falling down. And near the wall, you have a high enrichment of particles. So people have been asking the question is that at the small scale, what causes bub bubbles and particle clusters? And what kind of model do you need to capture them robustly with the minimal model? What is the minimal model that you need to do that? And if you go to device scale, the one that I showed you in the previous slide, you find that you get coherent structures, large coherent structures. Uh, say radial segregation would be a coherent structures. And it's the coherent structures that matter in terms of performance of chemical reactors and separators and so on. So how do you think about modeling these coherent structures effectively without having to resolve each and every cluster and each and every bubble that you have in this problem. Because if you try to resolve everything, the problem becomes horrendously large in terms of the computational complexity. And when you throw in chemical reactions and so on, it becomes intractable. So what are practical models? And so these are the kind of questions that we try to address. And, there, and if you go to even larger scale where particle, solids handling devices work together, you start getting some instabilities that come simply because your solids handling devices can talk to each other and create instabilities, but I'm not going to go into that part of the work that we did today. So let me talk a little bit about what we know about these uh, in the first part of the story. Now, I told you that what kind of a model can capture them robustly. So I'm going to have two slides that shows the model equations. So if you, uh, if you think about how to analyze these problems, the common way is to think in terms of some continuum models where if you have a just plain cold flow with no reactions and so on, you can write a mass balance for the particle phase and a mass balance for the fluid phase. So you get phi sub s is the volume fraction of particles and u sub s is some local average velocity of the particles. And um, 
Similarly, phi sub g is the volume fraction of the gas and u sub g is the local volume average velocity of the particles. It is a kind of, it simply says that I'm conserving mass for the both phases. And if you look at the momentum balances, you have inertial terms that appear on both sides, just similar to Navier-Stokes equation. Then you get gravitational terms that appear on the right-hand side. But because these two fluid, these two phases are flowing together, they exert force on each other, equal and opposite force is being exerted on each other. And then there is a stress that is transmitted because particles are talking to each other through collisions and enduring contact in the particle phase balance. And then there is this buoyancy force that acts on the gas. And so there is the rest of them shows up in here. Okay? And if you look at the minimal problem like that, because the density of the gas is so much higher than the density of the particles, you find that the inertia is completely in the gas phase, in the particle phase for these systems. So in those cases, what you find is that the, the stress that I have put in here is primarily the gas pressure. So what it means is that, that the two quantities that we really don't know are what to put for this F and what to put for the stress. So all our ignorances are built into those systems. So the question comes is that what is the minimum model that we need to consider to be able to capture them? Because that allows us to separate what is required versus what are details to get quantitative accuracy. And if you look at gas particle flows, this, this, this inter, inter, interaction force is primarily drag force. And if you look at, if you look at how drag force um, look like, okay, I'll come back to that in the next slide, is it's so what is important in that? So if you talk about a steady state problem, you find out that all these terms are not there and all these three terms go to zero. Simply drag balances the weight of the particle. That's a simple undergraduate fluidization experiment that you would have done in your courses before. When you have a dynamics, this term becomes important. And the, 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 the third term that we have here, the particle phase stress, is of a, uh, a one order less important. So if I say this tends to be uh, <clears throat> the dynamic problem, the, the, green o the black oval is most important, the green oval is next important, and only in limited places the um, the red dotted one becomes important. Okay, that is typically the order of magnitude. So if I want to try to predict things properly, I need to get the F correctly as good as possible, then worry about the sigma. Okay, that, that's the way the people have been working on this problem. Okay, and if you look at that F, it simply says it's a coefficient beta called drag coefficient multiplied by the relative velocity between the gas and the particle. And this beta has got hundreds of correlations that you can find in the literature. And the key thing is that this coefficient says that drag increases if you increase the volume fraction of particle. It's called the hindrance effect. If you have a lot of particles, it's more difficult for the, particle, the gas to go through. So if I imagine a simplest model that contains this character, okay, <clears throat> what can I predict? Not necessarily all the details, that's the kind of question that we ask. So bottom line of all our three, four years of work that came out was that if I, all I want to do is predict homogeneous fluidization, all I need is balance the drag and the gravity. I don't need anything else. But if I want to start seeing these instability structures of this kind, the first question is what drives the instability? It turns out the inertia, this has been, these are all inertial instabilities. Uh, and the fact that the void edge depends on the, uh, the, the, the drag coefficient de depends on the void edge like I mentioned to you in the previous slide. Those are making the system unstable. And the particle phase stress that I told you is of tertiary importance. That's the one who keeps saying, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. But unfortunately, it is so weak that you cannot stop it. So you start getting all these inhomogeneous structures because it's very weak, so you cannot stop these structures. And what we showed is that whether you are looking at the dense system or the dilute system, it is the same mechanism and you can connect the two instabilities as a single family of instabilities. That's what we showed in 1998. Okay. The, and we saw that it's robust. It does, it, all I need is just put Almost anything that I want, reasonable, logically reasonable function, you'll, pr you'll predict that. That's satisfying in one way because the any robust phenomena is the only one that we should trust. Anything that is very specific, you change something here and there, it goes away, you, I wouldn't trust them as a mathematical model. So these are very robust phenomena, we trust that. So <clears throat> then, then we ask the question, is that the, now that we know that this equation can predict these structures, can I simulate them? What happens if I go through and do a full-fledged numerical simulation of that? So we try to do that. 
and we took a small periodic box which is only 8 centimeter by 8 centimeter by 8 centimeter. We put about 75 micron particle and we put the usual periodic boundary condition. Let's see, simulate what happens. What we find is that you start getting inhomogeneous structures. We put more grit, we get finer structure. We put even more grit, we get even finer structures. So which one do I trust? And if I keep doing it, you find out that I have to get down to about 10 particle diameters or less. The grid has to be 10 particle diameter or less before things begin to give you consistent statistical quantities. So if I'm imagining pipe flowing in a one meter diameter, um, fluid particles flowing in a one meter diameter pipe and the particles are 100 micron, and if my grid is going to have to be one millimeter, I just cannot put enough grids in a, my system to solve this problem. So if you find that, that you run into a problem that the equation that I showed you are good at this scale, but this is your reactor, your vessel scale. And so if I go in and take a typical grid that I would use in solving this problem and blow it up, I'll see all these structures that I'm not going to be resolving. Because the, and if I zoom in further, I'll see the particles. So the question comes is that, that Engineers cannot put enough grids and solve the problem. You would not see daylight if you do that. So we need to have some ways of <coughs> probing macro scale features. So we started a research called start from this equation and develop something called filtered two fluid models. Okay. And um, normally I don't talk much about what we have done, what we are known for, but this is my home. So I can afford to tell you that my group is most known for having developed these types of models which are used widely in industry. So, <clears throat> so how do we do that? The, we, we, we somehow figure out a systematic way of doing this filtering operation. So how, do we, how did we do that? So we did these large periodic domain simulations for a large number of cases. And that provide us the computational data. The reason why we rely on computational data is that it's very difficult to go and get experimental measurements on that scale. The second thing is that these instabilities start at small scale. So if I put a probe, I have disturbed it. So intrusive probes don't work. And non-intrusive probes are not transparent. You cannot see anything inside. So computations provide us a way to access things that we cannot do. So we did large number of simulations for a range of uh, particle concentrations inside the boxes and then for different properties of particles and so on. So once we have that, that we have this treasure trove of, of computational data, of finely resolved simulations. So once we have that, then we can, if I, I'll show illustrate that in 2D. So this is the fine grid snapshot that we have gotten. Then we can start filtering those things. So we can filter them and then try to get these, what happened if I get filters of different sizes? And then how do I get the filtered information? So if you take those models I wrote and then do the filtering, I'll start getting a number of covariances for which that I have to develop models for. So that's what we worked on developing. And so the, so the, that will give us some idea of how to correct for that. So, so if, if I, if, when you, if, if I solve a filtered equation and let's say I'm having a grid of this size, I'm not going to see anything underneath that. So that is going to tell me that, oh, everything is uniform. Because that's, I'm not resolving anything smaller than that. And if I say everything is uniform, and if the gas, the particle have, the gas has to go relative to the particles, it will experience a certain drag force. But in reality, there is a lot of bypassing path. The gas is not going to contact the particles that much. And so it's going to experience a lot less interparticle forces, inter interface forces, less drag. And so we end up overestimating the drag. And that turns out to be the biggest problem that you have to correct for. I'll illustrate through one example later. So <clears throat> the way, and physically, if you think about it, when you filter it, you get a filtered gas velocity and a filtered solid velocity. But the filtered gas velocity here is different than the average gas velocity seen by the particles. Imagine in the box, all the particles are here and the gas is going here, that the gas particle is not seeing that. So what is seen by the particle is different than what is the actual average gas velocity. And that difference is known called drift velocity. So if you can estimate the drift velocity, then we know how to correct for the drag. So the question then is that how do you model the drift velocity? And that took us about 10 years worth of work. And, <clears throat> and we used first 
simple minded thinking like well you know it has to depend upon the filter size you know it has to depend upon how much particles there are you know what the relative velocity so the common sense things that you can you consider and then we can fit them and when we do we got some models but they were never that good and now everybody does uh, machine learning right we have it's, it's a, so we just said let's use some of these techniques and then consider a large number of possible variable to see what might matter and that release that there's one additional variable that is making a consistently showing up which is the filtered pressure uh, gradient intuitively there is no basis for me to think about why it would matter but the, the machine learning analysis kept telling me it matters so we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to fundamentally explain where that is coming from. So at the end, we managed to develop a model and that is what my PhD student, um, Wendy Jiang, did and got published in the last two years. And so we developed these models for that. So now we have developed a model that al allows us to correct for the consequences of the structures that we don't resolve in our flow simulation. So we can try to do uh, the simulations of large domain with a relatively few number of grids. And this, I talked to everything about Euler Euler simulation. Some of you work in that one, you might know, it's called two fluid models. But there are other types of simulation called Euler Lagrange models. The same thing applies for Euler Lagrange models as well. So we worked on that too. So, how big a correction am I talking about? This slide illustrates that. <clears throat> if I look at what is the effective force, we have an effective drag coefficient that you have for a filter of some size divided by the uh, the the uh, drag coefficient that you would predict if you completely ignored that, okay? If, if you assume everything was uniform. If this is one, it means that in reality, everything was uniform. In reality, everything is not uniform. So this number is less than one. This ratio is less than one. So we write that as one minus h, okay? And if you plot that h as a function of volume fraction, remember h depends on many variables other than volume fraction. I collapsed it down to one volume fraction. So you can see it in a graph page. You find that here is very little particles, here is maximum parting, maximum packing, and H is zero at very, very low end. And when you get a lot of particles, structures cannot form, so it's again um, a zero, meaning that it's a homogeneous system. But in between, it can be quite different from zero. And here you have quantities here, which is how big these filter sizes are, okay? And this is in dimensionless form. To give you an idea, two means one centimeter for most particles. So when the grid is five centimeters, you'll be up there. So if I have a very large vessel and I'm going to use five centimeter grids, all the structures underneath that five centimeters that you are not resolving is going to decrease the drag by 70%. Then the number disappeared for some reason. This number is 0.7. Okay. So it's 70%, which means that if the true drag is three, you'll be predicting 10 if you don't, if you, if you ignore that. <coughs> And as a result, your, all your predictions about the flow in the device will be completely off. There is a challenge problem that people have developed in saying that I will begin to trust your model at least a little if you can do a good job of predicting this challenge problem. Okay. The, so this was published by a combination of the <coughs> National Department of Energy and also an organization called PSRI. So they did experiment in a, in a 90 centimeter diameter tube, seven meter. They put a bed static bed of about two and a half meters, the particles are here, and then, <clears throat> so they, they got experimental data. And I hope it's predicted. Can you predict it? Uh, at least write closely. <clears throat> and the, 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 their guidance was that, that, can you put grids like this? So they even talked about grid structure to use because they are practical grid structures. So if you try to simulate that problem using all the reasonable two fluid model, uh, uh, for, uh, constitutive uh, relationship, you find that, that if you put 40,000 cells, you'll just say the bed in seven minutes, seven seconds will start being, all the particles will blow out of the system. You put 75,000 grid, they'll blow out of the system. You put 198,000, they'll blow out of the system. But if you look at the experimental data, the bed height is only four meters. That means only come up to here. It doesn't blow out of the bed. So you are completely missing the physics when you do that. So this is why if you don't put any of the subgrid model I told you about, but if you put the subgrid model, you find that whether you put 40,000 or 75,000, you get the same thing and you are able to predict that. And if you look at the movie, which may not play, so it's not a, it's not a simple structure, it's a pretty complicated flow problem. 
And this is the resolved part of the flow problem. So if you go to the grid, there are some unresolved underneath that and the unresolved is being modeled. The, I told you the example of hydrodynamics, then you can ask the question, what about un, the unresolved part of, in heat transfer, in mass transfer, in chemical reaction? So you can talk about corrections for that too, but what we found is that hydrodynamic correction is the most important one. If you miss the hydrodynamics, everything else is wrong. If you get the hydrodynamics and if you only, even if you ignore all the other correction, you still do a good job. If you include all the other corrections, you do a little better. So ultimately, we, what matters is hydrodynamics. So our work has been focused on hydrodynamics because that's the critical player. <coughs> and this particular one was done with ANSYS who are interested in incorporating our considerative models into their codes. What I talked about in this part of the talk is that for group B, where I only considered inelastic collisions between particles, no interparticle forces. We didn't consider Van der Waals force, liquid bridge, electrostatic interaction. So our work in the last five, six years has also been focused on that. I told you that this is the Geldart diagram and I worked on this part, but now we are trying to work on this part, okay? What is involved in that? That I told you that, that the place where interparticle forces begin to become important, interparticle forces are too important, we cannot do anything about. But if you focus on this region, this region, you may be able to do something. So we are, we are working on that. Just to illustrate how big an effect it has got. <clears throat> we took a domain, we put a million particles, and we simulated the Newton's equation for all million of them, and gas flow is solved. It's called the euler lagrange simulation. If you put 75 micron particle at 30% uh, volume fraction, and if you run, you get a result like that, okay? That is, it makes no difference. It is very, even at the small scale, it's a very violent non-uniform distribution. And the experimentally, what people have found is that if you add about 3% fine particles, fine particles is about 20, 25 microns, 3%. It makes a huge difference in the flow behavior. Okay, I add 3% fine particles and I repeat, nothing happens. But if I turn on the interparticle forces, everything becomes um, frozen. So you affect the flow path. The interparticle forces are important to uh, explain the effects of addition of fines in these systems. So how does it do that? It does that because it changes how the drag is happening and changes how the stress is happening. And this is something that we have worked on, but I'm not going to go into that story today. So what I try to do in this first part of the story is that you get structures that form of this, from the scale of a few particles to all the way to the reactors. You can try to resolve the larger one because they are the most important ones in, when you try to model the reactors. But the small one matter. If you don't account the effect of the small one, your predictions are off by a big margin. So how do you correct for the ones that you are not resolving is the, is the, is the crux of the game. How many of you have heard of large eddy simulations in turbulence? So some of you have heard of large eddy simulations. The same idea that they are doing, you know, for the, for, the, for the stresses they are correcting for the part that you are not resolving. But it turns out in two-phase flow, you have to do the same thing, but the more important one is not the stress, but the drag. And then we have to, we are working on trying to correct, we have worked on trying to correct for that. So for, the, for illustrating the effect of interparticle forces, I'll tell a different story, okay? Any questions on the first part of the story? Okay, so a different story. <clears throat> in this story, the dry powder inhalers, uh, in this case, the Van der Waals forces become very important and it affects the behavior of the, the performance device of the device. So uh, we have done some work on simulations. The simulation try to understand how uh, <clears throat> these uh, deagglomeration take place. So let, let me explain that. <clears throat> in dry powder inhalers, you have an inhaler in which the particles are, are being ejected when you press them and it goes through your mouth, throat, trachea, and then it goes to the lungs, okay? And the go hope is that, that you will deposit fine particles of the active pharmaceutical ingredient as uniformly as you can in the lung. <clears throat> okay. that's, the, <clears throat> that's the purpose. And this is widely used in pulmonary infections, COPD, and so on. 
And more and more drugs are being discovered that are not water soluble. And so they're very difficult to deliver. So they're making us fine powders. And the, there is a great deal of effort to see how many of them can be delivered in this manner. And so there is a <coughs> quite a bit of drug development work that goes on here. But if you, if you look at what can happen when you inhale it, the particles can get trapped at any of these points. So if you want it to escape the mouth, throat, and the trachea region and get here, the particles have to be less than 5 micron, preferably 1 or 2 micron. <clears throat> if it is much smaller than 1 micron, they'll go in and come right back. You don't want them either. So you don't want it to be too small. You want it to be in the 1 to 2 micron range. <clears throat> so the, if you have larger particles, they will just deposit in the mouth, throat region. <clears throat> So if I take these small particles and if I try to deliver it, they are very sticky. They will, even in your, in your packaging, they'll agglomerate. They'll give you very big clusters. <coughs> that means they're no longer one micron particles. They are 50 micron particles. So how do you deliver them? So that they, a large number of the drugs are delivered with carriers. So they use 70 micron or so lactose carriers, and then they deposit the drug on top of them. And they are attached to them through a Van der Waals force that's holding them in place. So you package them in the blisters, and then when you inhale them, the blisters get open, and then you get in. So when you so if you look at what happened, <coughs> so in this in this device that I'm kind of this simple-minded device that I'm showing, the, the movie is not playing here for some reason. There's a movie. These particles, <coughs> these particles will get dragged down, and they will flow. But when they flow, they are going to collide with various uh, with among themselves, and that will release the particle. I'll show some an animation of that. So the question is that fine particles that are released from here, known as fine particle fraction, that's the jargon that they use in this field, that depends upon the interaction between gas and these agglomerates, the particles colliding with each other, particles colliding with the wall. So what is the dominant mechanism by which they are released? <coughs> And then how can we de device, de design better devices for that? So if I, if I show some movie on this, I'm, I don't think I can play. Uh, I have to go here and play. <clears throat> so if I, if, I, if I imagine an agglomerate, and if a gas flow past, flows past the agglomerate, then it can, it can release the particles. <clears throat> if, you have a, if you have a surface, and if a particle collides to the surface, it can release. And if you have two particles in the flow collide with each other, <clears throat> it'll again get released. <clears throat> there are the three mechanisms that you're relying on to release the particles in the inhaler. If you put it here, you've done it, you want all of that to happen within that 0.2 seconds, and then go in. That, that's the hope. <clears throat> <coughs> So if you look at what's available, I told you about these diseases, there are a large number of these inhalers available. So on what basis do we design them and what basis do we judge them? So the, in the US, the Food and Drug Administration was interested in, in developing a computational tool to, to help them simulate and understand how these devices perform because they have to approve them. <coughs> so they gave us some money and they said that, you know, in reality, it, the inhalation profile of patients. So if you look at this, how much <clears throat> velocity with which you inhale versus time for people with different diseases. There are some standard um, uh, inhalation profiles for people with different types of diseases. The room is really dry for me, throat, sorry. So we asked the question that, how are these agglomerated fluidase and transported? How does the inhalation profile affects deagglomeration? What are the dominant deagglomeration pathways? How can one improve inhalation device? This is what people are working on this field are interested in. And our, whole, our goal was how can simulations help? <clears throat> and we, we, eventually we gave our simulation to FDA. They are using it in their, uh, in their, uh, their own work. <clears throat> so again, if, if I remind you, this is a diagram I showed you before. You have an inhaler. <clears throat> and then it's going to go. 
and we are asking the question where does deagglomeration take place. So, that is going to take place in the device, it is going to take place in the mouth throat region. But once it goes in here, all the carrier particles are all deposited in your mouth. Only the API particles will go here. You do not want the carrier to go there because then you will get problems because they are too big. So, if you want to study how the flow occurs here, you use a different tool. There are some tools called digital twins that people have developed about how to do this. And, but what happens here is something what we are looking at. So, we are looking at the deagglomeration process here and here. So, let me show you some results on that. So, we took one commercial uh, device called Ellipta and then tried to look at what happened in these, um, in these systems. So, you can go to the web and then you can see pictures of Ellipta inside. We got a, we got a sample of Ellipta. To see how big a device we are talking about, your, your mouthpiece is going to be over here and there is a chamber here and you see two parts here and they are going to fit in here when you, when you insert this here and that is going to give you two capsule locations. These are the one, these so called blisters carry the medicine. This can deliver two different medicines here. So, when you click this, both from pouches, uh, the, the drug will fall into these. And then, when you close the top, you find out that there is a grating here. So, gas comes in, and here is the mouthpiece. So, when you suck the air, when you inhale from here, air has to come in from the top and then work their way here. And the air is going to pick up these. Uh, agglomerates and then they are going to flow and they are going to flow in this system. So, to give you the length scale of this is only one and a half to two centimeters long, it is a very small device. And the question is that, that how does, how do things work here and how can you improve the device, the device geometry. Okay. <clears throat> and if you, if you look at the, the, the a common drug that is called Anora, it delivers two drugs, formulation A and B and each pouch contains about 12 and a half milligrams of uh, dose. And if you look at the active ingredients, that is 62 micrograms and 25 micrograms, there is only 0.5 percent is APA, API. Everything else is lactose particles. <coughs> if you look at that, this one is even smaller, 0.2 percent is, is API, everything else is lactose particles. So, you are trying to make sure that, that this small amount of uh, stuff that is sticking to the surface of the carrier particle will get detached and they will be delivered to you. And if you look at the commercial devices, none of them are any good at delivering more than 30 percent. So, 70 percent of the drug that you put in just goes and gets deposited somewhere within your mouth throat region. And they are not effective because they will just go into a GI tract and they will get destroyed, they are not going to get absorbed. So, the only thing that goes into the, the, into the lung are going to be used. So, you are throwing away essentially 70 percent of the medicine. More and more drugs are being discovered that can be delivered only in this manner because they are, they are not they are stable when they go through the GI tract. And, and if they are very expensive medicine, you do not want to lose 70 percent of that. And that is the reason why people are working on. So, what is the perfect inhaler that is going to give you 100 percent? That is the holy grail that people are looking for. And the idea is that people are trying different experiments and different simulations to help the experiment to see how to get there. Okay. So, we we spent a lot of years, lot of years, literally four or five years trying to build this computational framework and then try to develop some simplified computational tool because a very large um, uh, high performance computing is needed. But, but trust me, we did that. I will just show you some results. So, here is a case where we put two different drugs and you can see the, the each drug as a blue is a carrier particle and green is the APA particle, yellow is the carrier particle and the red is the uh, um, APA particle. And you see only in this in this one the, the green and the uh, red because the, the the carrier particles are all coated, you cannot see them. Okay, that is what. So, if I now inhale, I just want you to keep track of the physical time that is over there, uh, and you can see that this is the kind of flow pattern. So, now people have not seen before how the flow occurs because simulations have not been done. Everything has been experimental and you measure what comes out at the end. That is really what people have done. But now for the first time you can begin to see <coughs> what goes on. So, we can simulate like this and then we can collect lots and lots of samples. So, we have uh, um, a, a data overload. So, now we have to process all of them to see what we learned from that. And that takes even longer time than the simulation to do as some of you who do simulation would have known. And if you look at that inhalation profile I showed you, I gave you two examples of that. If you look at the red, the inhalation goes 
to about three seconds, and the peak is about 0.7 seconds, and the and the, the the more severe patient inhalation goes to two seconds, and the peak is again at 0.7 seconds. And a lot of the stuff that people have done in computations have only looked at gas phase because particle simulations are very expensive. And they all look at what is called the peak inhalation flow rate. Let me just simulate flow at that condition and use that as a guide for me to make judgment. Okay. But if you look at the time, most of the in particles have been ejected from there. At this point, what is remaining is only 1% of the particle. It looks like a lot, but it's only 1% of the particle. In 0.01, so that is, that's over here. Everything in the device is happening, not at the peak inhalation rate, but, so when peak inhalation rate didn't make sense or didn't agree with the data, it's not surprising it's happening because it's all happening in this region, okay? So that's the first thing that we learned. And then, then if, then if you look at what is the flow pattern, that's happening. And then what is the mechanism? I told you the three mechanisms, right? In which particles get released. What we find is that if you look at the flow pattern, a lot, there are so many holes here. Most of the airs are, air is going through these holes and then they're going very fast and they're coming in, you form a, a counter rotating vortex in this. And a small amount of air is coming from here, going and picking them up and then coming over here. And so when they're coming, the particles are being carried slowly, 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 and suddenly they see a very high velocity gas. So a slowly moving particles suddenly get exposed to very high velocity gas, and that strips the, the agglomerate. It's not the collisions with the wall, it's not the collision with themselves, it is that abrupt exposure to high velocity gas. So your goal then is to try to see how can I make device modification to try to yeah, <coughs> increase the, um, the uh, the, the relative velocity that suddenly gets exposed to that. So we then came up with the argument is that, that what if I say that I'm not going to make all these seven holes available to me immediately. I'm going to close these three holes magically initially and at some point I'm going to say open sesame and they'll open. Okay. So and that the delay time I'm going to give is about 0 0.05 seconds. So it means that air here would have picked up a certain velocity. So when this particle comes, the air is going to be even faster. And then you do that, you find that instead of 37% being released, you can release 51%. Just to illustrate that when you get these in this type of results, you have some experiments that you can do to try to understand them. <clears throat> and you can keep playing more, more, but I'm not in the business, but I'm just showing you that I'm doing this. Job. So we illustrate these white papers and if companies want to pick up and run with that, that's for them, okay? But releasing everything here is not the full story. You need to see what happens as it goes through the mouth and throat and that's what we then started looking at it. And so we only, there are examples of these pathway through the mouth, the throat, and then the, the trachea, and then the different branches that people have published. So we can get CAT files of those flow geometries. And now we have even files available for people with all kinds of different diseases. And so the, the device geometries, I mean the simulation domains are available for this system. So we focus mainly over here, not the proportion here, because that is where you need all these carrier particles and everything mm -hmm. that to be considered. So we did simulation. <clears throat> where here is my ellipta, and then here is my mouth, here throat, and then up to this part, okay? So we did simulation. And if you do a simulation, here we only filled one blister because these are, these are expensive calculations. You can see suddenly they'll speed up when it comes there. And then, then we look at what, what happens as it goes through, and then we generate the, uh, the particles are getting released, and particles are getting deposited, and then we generate the data set. This is, for the, this is the first time in the literature, or again, even in companies, anyone has got this kind of a data available to interrogate what is happening in these flow problems. So, uh, <clears throat> so the, the, the blue here is, blue here are the API particles they are going through. And so we can, <clears throat> we can look at where they are depositing and where they are flowing and stuff like that. So again, you get a yeah, huge amount of data that comes in. And then, then if you look at that, then you can ask the question that, can, can tell me what happened in this region, what happened in this region. So you can analyze the behavior in each region as a function of time, and then try to learn something from that. So what we want to, I'll tell you one example of that, 
if you look at the three types of inhalation profile, if you take the very, um, if you take the moderate asthma case, a black one, you got about 37% released when it came out of the inhaler. But as it goes through the mouth, they're getting further released. Why? Because the, uh, the mixture of the particles and the air are coming through the mouthpiece. And the moment they come to the mouth, there is an expansion of the cross section. So gas slows down, the particles don't. So suddenly you see another increase in relative velocity. So that allows the particles to, um, to undergo more deagglomeration. But then you find that it decreases because when you have a high velocity, you have a high turbulence. And the turbulence is going and pushing the API particles to the wall and you're losing them. And then eventually when it comes around, you find that it has come back here. In fact, the moderate asthma guy had, had a worse um, um, uh, final, uh, worse fraction, FPF fraction going through your, your lung, lung channel than the person with the uh, severe asthma. Okay. So, the reason, so because of what happened in the mouth. But I cannot go and redesign the mouth for you, but I can only redesign the, the, um, <clears throat> the, uh, the device. So how can I redevise the device? Is that that even though I can have a very high breathing rate, I don't need the breathing rate. Can I have it in a way in my device after the first bit of taken, suddenly the resistance of the device goes up. So you can't breathe that fast, okay? Then it becomes more difficult. You, even, even, I can, if, even if I can breathe faster, I'm forced to breathe only slowly so that these turbulent losses can be minimized. So these are the kinds of questions that one can ask to see how do you modify the device design to do a better job in the device and also in the Loss, minimize the losses in the mouth throat region. And this is an active area of research that's happening. And this is uh, our group was the first of this kind to do this type of simulation to show that you can get insight into these problems. And so the, the critical regions are one is over here and one is over at this part. And so what is happening, how they're depositing is something that we're still working on. The postdoc is trying to collect some more data. Come. The, the general belief is that, that the person with the better inhalation profile will do a better job, but what we're showing that's not always true. We can explain why it's not always true. And so we are talking about design modification and we, we illustrated some design other people can do more, more later. So <clears throat> how am I doing for time? Did we start early? We can go on, okay. Um, <clears throat> So the third story I want to say, this is very special to me because something I've, I'm, I've, I've been working on and, um, and I'll tell you some story about that. So particles pick up charges. Huh? Now here, because it's humid all the time. So when you come in and touch the door, you don't get a shock, right? But in the, in the USA, when we go to the office in the winter time, if I go touch the door, I get a shock. Because I've got, I, would, I, would have, I would have put on my coat, I would have, tucked my, I would have touched my car steering wheel. So I often tell my wife that that's how I'm going to die one day because I'm going to get a shock and I'm going to die one day. I'm going to be electrocuted with that. It's very, very severe. You can, can see that. So I, I make sure that now I, I you know, wash my hands before I go in. It's wet and then I touch the door because it's... It, it, so the, char the, the tribal charges can be a big safety hazard. There are many instances of ex dust explosions and so on. They're all triggered by tribal charging. And many people have died because of that. In the industrial accident, the trip, tribal charging is implicated in many of the explosion. So, the, uh, so there is a lot of interest in trying to understand tribal charging. And it's also saying that people don't think about how charges affect the flow in many of these common devices, like fluidized beds, for example. But <clears throat> does it have anything to do with the particle segregations in riser? And uh, can we do experiments? So we started thinking about that. And the, what motivated us was that in, back in 2000 or so, I visited a lab where they were doing experiments in riser, and you could see the sparks. You could see the, the dielectric breakdown happening. And saying that, how could it not be matter? So we went back and then did some analysis, and then um, <clears throat> we have been uh, looking at that. And then we also did some experiment in 2003 in Singapore. My former student was doing some experiment. He was on the faculty there. He was doing an experiment. I worked with him a little bit. And here, for example, polypropylene particles are going up through the pipe. And you see that they're going in kind of sequence of slugs. So we first thought they're a sequence of slug. And then the student went and took a photo from an angle. There's nothing in the core. So you have these particles that are in the outer annular region and rising up and the core is just gas and what is pushing them? Why are they sitting there? 
it turns out these particles are very charged. Okay. And the, so the, these polypropylene, the, in polymerization reactors, charges is a big problem. So a lot of the work that we funded around the world is because of problems in, poly, in polymerization reactors. And here is an experiment that we did a few years ago. A square cross-section bit, uh, uh, glass wall. The particles are 250 micron polyethylene beads. Same air, same, um, everything the same. And we put air uh, at, a bar, at, a, at the bottom at a particular um, velocity, both sides, okay? But here the relative humidity is 20%, here the relative humidity is 60%. So when you fluidize, both of them start like that, okay? And after a while, this continues to be like this, and this one settles down like this, and then it is, um, it almost looks like a fixed bed, okay? Where is the gas going on? What is happening? So if you take these particles and then pour them out in a Faraday cup and measure what's going on, you find out they have charges. This is 0.5 nanograms, nanocoulombs per gram, but this is 11 nanocoulombs per gram. So they charge much more, and that somehow the charging is affecting the way the particles pack. So how important are charging, and how does it affect the flow is something that we have been um, we have been thinking about. These experiments were done in 2017, but people have known that charge particles acquire charge going back to the 1960s. So we did not discover that the particle acquire charge. So because people <clears throat> new particles acquire charges, whether it is a silica alumina particle or polymer particle or glass beads, it just doesn't matter, they acquire charges. People have been asking, so what's the typical charge level? So if you go to the literature and look at that, you find out that the charge level can be anywhere from 0.1 to 10 microcoulombs per meter squared of surface area, of external surface area of particles. These are experimental data, okay? So I ask the question is that at this level, can the charges affect the flow behavior? So in 2002, we went back and then we, we, we said, yes, it can explain all the radial segregation. Okay, I went to went and present the paper and everybody said, blah, I don't believe you. So it's all hydrodynamics, so don't waste your time on it. So we said, okay, fine, if nobody wants to believe me, I'll stop. And then we didn't do anything on it for 15 years. Then we developed all the hydrodynamic models that I showed you in the first part of the talk. And then we were able to get the fluidized bed behavior correctly. But when we went to the riser, we couldn't predict the, the, the segregation properly. Then we are back to square one. I have no explanation. So then they said that, no, you have to come back to this. This is what it is. So now I, I believe that this is responsible for the radial segregation that happens in the riser. Because I already showed, we already showed that it happens. And I had a very, very good master student who came from Saudi Aramco. He is now the CEO of Saudi Aramco Ventures. Um, <clears throat> so, it's, uh, so I was fortunate to have some really smart people come and address this problem at that time. So what he did was that, that if you have a flow and if a particle is a charge, the particles generate an electric field. You can solve the Poisson's equation and calculate the electric field. And that electric field pushes the particle to the wall. You can show that. So that, and, and that is commensurate with the kind of segregation that people are seeing experimentally. So the, the, what we came now to say recently is that how do you, who is going to give you the charge? And if you change the gas, what's going to happen? So we have to develop some model to describe the tribal charging of particles, even if it is only hand-waving, phenomenological or empirical model, doesn't matter. But we have to develop a model for that. And people have known that, that if you take nitrogen and argon, for example, particles acquire a lot less charge in argon than in nitrogen. Can we use that to help us develop the model okay? and learn something from that? That's what we did. So my student, Shavyu Liu, who graduated recently, he, he just did simple experiments. He took square containers, filled them with different amounts of particles, different walls and different uh, particles, and then we put them on a vibrator bit and just took them for a while, took them for a long time, particles acquired charge. Then you put them on a Faraday cup and measure the charge. And then he did simulations to match, to complement that. So if, I doubt, if, I, if you propose a charging model, and then can you, can, can you simulation reproduce what you saw experimentally? So this is kind of a, a, <clears throat> a two-pronged approach he did. And if you look at some of his experimental data, when the, when the experiments were done in nitrogen, what he's plotting here is the surface area of all the particles. Simply think of how much mass we loaded in the 
the container, the more particles we put in, the more surface area, okay? And how much is the total mass that I'm measuring in the Faraday cup? So naturally, you put more particle, you measure more charge, okay? So, it's, so if you put in nitrogen, we are, we are measuring charges like that. You put in argon, you measure a lot less charge. Why? How do you, how do you capture that? And we did that for a different combination. I'm just showing you only one combination here. So if you look at what was there in the literature over the last 50 years, if two particles come together, let's say there is, they're different in nature, charges will flow from one to the other. The, that is true for metals, that people have known that for almost 100 years. But when you take insulating particles, the concept is very vague because if they don't contact electrons, so how do you do that? So there's a lot of questions of what is being transferred. That's an ongoing research and I, I, work, I work with a colleague who does molecular dynamic simulation to try to probe that problem. But here, we didn't address that in this problem. So there is the charge is being transferred. And so what people do is that invent a, a fictitious function called effective work function that each material has so that, that we can characterize that to see how, what is the propensity for the chain charge. So people have developed 10 years ago model, if you bring two particles together, the rate at which charge transfer is going to be given by something. And even before that, people have discussed something called charge relaxation. So particles come together, they charge, but they want to come apart, some charge goes back, that's the relaxation. And that depends upon the surface characteristics. That's also there. So you, we can build models based on those two. But that wouldn't explain why things are different in nitrogen and argon. So what is different in nitrogen? So the the nitrogen and argon is that, that we have to account for the dielectric breakdown of the gas. In argon, the gas breaks down very easily, you get sparks. In nitrogen, you don't, you have to go to a much higher strength. So the dielectric strength of these materials are off by seven times, eight times, something like that, six, six times. <clears throat> so we built a model how to bring that into the analysis and then we built the code to do simulations with many particles to, to look at that. And so when we, when we then try to capture the data with nitrogen and argon, it turns out that we can do it consistently with some adjustable parameter. The only difference is that the known dielectric strength difference is all that we use in this system. So the difference is, is due to the fact that you have this dielectric um, uh, breakdown. So the only, the gas breakdown has to be, in the nitrogen that it is not happening, okay? Where, the, where does the breakdown voltage comes in? If you put more and more and more particles, more and more electric field is going to get, stronger and stronger electric field is going to get built up. So if you look at how many particles I put in here, this is only about 10 grams of particles. But if you take a fluidized bed, they have so much more, right? You have so much more particles. So it's like going further and further and further to the next room, right? So what happens if you go to real systems? Even this will go and then start having dielectric breakdown when you go to larger systems. So our current hypothesis is that it doesn't matter what gas it is. If you in a real large system, the amount of charge that we, we have in the system is at the critical conditions of limiting dielectric breakdown happening in the thing. And once you make that hypothesis, you can estimate what the charges of particle in the, in the back of the envelope calculation. Because <clears throat> otherwise I wouldn't know. So our hypothesis is that, that the extent to which particle charge is dictated by the dielectric breakdown, doesn't matter what gas you are using, um, <clears throat> hydrogen or methane or, or light gas oil, this is what is dictating this problem. But that's how somebody has got to prove that. The other thing is that, other thing is that what people have known is that the bed be, that behaves at one way in one atmosphere, but slightly differently at bi fi atmosphere in many, many systems. There's no some good explanation for that because the change in gas density is so small compared to the density of the solid, why would that matter? But what happens is when you go from one atmosphere to five atmosphere, you literally increase the breakdown strength by five times which means the particles can now hold much larger charge. That means that can come and affect the flow in a much larger way. And that's what's happening in the system. So we have shown that the effect of pressure can be explained through this. So these are stuff that needs to be done to explain. So, it, it, that, so we think that dielectric breakdown is not only a safety hazard, but it actually has an impact in real systems in many flow problems. And uh, <clears throat> I'll close by saying that not everybody believes me.
So it is still a controversial thing and it's something that people are going to have to work out. So let me conclude by saying that I gave you three examples. The first one I talked about is particle transport in circulating beds. And the, the key thing is that you have multi-scale multi structure, inherent instabilities at various scales, and so on. Our contribution has been developing practical models for that. <clears throat> the second example dealt with inhalers. Our contribution has been to understand the mechanism by which the deagglomeration takes place and some ways of asking questions about how to modify the inhaler design to achieve what we want. The third one is turbocharging of particles. We showed that, that it actually affects the flow and we showed that the dielectric breakdown is very important if you want to be able to capture that. In fact, you can use it as a criteria to determine how much charges are there. Okay? And um, the, uh, so in that sense, this can, we can also assess the safety risks of those systems and we can also assess how, if, whether or not they're going to affect the flow problem. So with that, I will stop. And um, <clears throat> yeah, I worked with lots of students, lots of colleagues, uh, people from funding agencies. Thank you for listening.